Word of God. How about you? Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our dear, kind, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have to come out and to study your Word. Tonight, though, we need the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher and our guide. We love you so much. Bless us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Daniel, chapter 8. And as we come to Daniel, chapter 8, Daniel, chapter 8 is an interesting um, chapter because, once again, we find that Daniel has another vision. And so in this we began to see something unfold very, very quickly. But before we go there, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to go there. I want you to find it. I want you to put a note sheet in there or, or a question card or something because I'd like to take you to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Now, we looked at this verse the other night. And I want us to take and in, in, in take a look at this once again because we, we looked at it a little bit for a different part of this verse, but I want us to catch this. Revelation 14, verse 7. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. It's good to hear those pages turn. I want to try and give you time to look this stuff up because it's important that we see it out of our Bible and for ourselves. Revelation 14 and verse 7. If you're there, please say amen. Amen. Saying with a loud voice, why loud? Well, so it can be heard, that's right. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Now that word fear there does not mean to be afraid of God. God doesn't want you to be afraid of Him. God wants you to love Him enough to respect Him and, and give reverence to His name. Amen? Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His what? Judgment, not might come is come and worship him that made what's another word for made created heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water so we looked at here and saw the fact that we focused on the idea that jesus is a creator god amen and that he is worthy of worship amen and he set up a memorial for creation that mankind would always remember that he is their creator god and that's the seventh day sabbath but then, you know, as we looked at on Wednesday night, there was a power that arose that thought to change times and laws and has tried to move people away from the keeping of God's law. Now, take your Bibles and go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians, New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'd like verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I would like verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Now remember what we just read. For the hour of his judgment is come. Notice Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, for we must, what's that next word? All appear before the what? Judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now let me ask you a question. That word done, is that a passive word or an active word? Okay, it's past tense, but I'm not asking the tense. It's an action word. To do something means you did something, which means it was done. You follow what I'm saying? In other words, today people say to me, oh, you know, I'm saved by grace. I don't have to do anything. doesn't matter how I live. God's going to save me because I love him and I believe in him. Well, remember, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so, obviously, through this verse, it says that we're going to receive judgment based on what? Come on, what's the Bible say? What we've done. That's what the Bible says. Now you say, well, pastor, you're trying to put me under law. No, I'm not trying to put you under law. I'm just trying to forewarn you that your actions speak louder than your words. Amen? 
So you can say I'm a Christian, you can say I love Jesus, but if you don't follow Him and you don't serve Him, how much do you really love Him? Amen? Amen. So here we see that we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now take your Bibles and go with me back to Daniel. And I'd like to go back a chapter. Hopefully you have a card in Daniel chapter 8. I want to come to chapter 7, and I want to remind us of a sequence that we learned on Wednesday night. Daniel chapter 7, I would like to come to verse 9. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. It says, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Remember, this is the vision where they saw the lion and the bear and the the leopard and the nondescript type beast, this fierce beast that had ten horns. And then after that arises another little horn. In fact, let me come back to verse 8. And I considered the horns, that's the horns that were on the head of the beast of verse 7. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another what? Little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking what? Great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Who's the Ancient of Days? That's God the Father. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. The throne, his throne, was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and what? And the books were opened. So, So what sequence do we see? We see the little horn, and we see followed by judgment, right? Now notice, we see that once again. Jump down with me to verse 21. Verse 21, And I beheld in the same horn, what horn are we talking about? The little horn. Made war with the saints and prevailed against them. What's the next word? Until the ancient of days came and the what? And judgment was given to who? To the saints of the Most High, and a time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now, once again, what did we see? We saw a sequence of the little horn followed by judgment. That's absolutely right. Now, jump down with me again, and we'll go to verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse in the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he, talking about who? Little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change what? Times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and a dividing of time, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So here three times in chapter 7, we have seen the sequence of the little horn followed by what? Judgment. Now, if God repeats it three times, do you think it's important we understand that? Yes, absolutely. Now, come with me to chapter 8. I want to take and bring you to the screen for just a moment. Because I put a timeline up there. If you remember when we went through Daniel chapter 2, it took us from Babylon, the head of gold, arms and chests of silver, media Persia, belly and thighs of brass, which was Greece, legs of iron, which was Rome, and then you have the ten kingdoms or the division of Rome as to what we know as Europe. Then the Bible says, Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands. We know that was the second coming of Jesus and the setting up of his kingdom. But here it is. This takes us down to the division of Rome in 476 A.D. Then you have Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we saw the winged lion. We saw the bear that was raised on one side. We saw the leopard with four heads and four wings. And we saw this fierce, nondescript beast that had how many horns? Ten horns. That's right. That brings us down. The horns are the same as the toes in the image. So it brings us down through Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then into the division of Rome. And then we take and now see something further in chapter 7. Remember? 
So if you look at this time chart, you can see that you've got Babylon that ruled from 606 to 539. Then you have Media Persia that ruled till 331. Then you have Greece that ruled till 168. Then you have Pagan Rome. And they crossed the time from B.C. to A.D. Now, they come to 476 A.D., you have the division into the Ten Kingdoms, and the Ten Kingdoms now, you see three of them uprooted. Papal Rome now, the Little Horn, now takes control, and they rule for 1260 years, or a time, times, and a dividing of times. Now, notice, after the Little Horn, or after the papacy rules, after they're taken out in 1798, and what I mean by taking out is this. Pope Pius VI was taken captive by General Berthier, the French. And he was taken and put in captivity. He died in captivity. I want you to be aware of something, and that is that all that did is take away their political power. They never ceased to be a church, okay? So they're still a church. They still were a church. But it took away their political power because during the Dark Ages, go back and read about it. Go to your encyclopedia and look up the, the Walden season, the Huden, Huguenots, and, and look up... Um, uh, the Dark Ages and what happened during that time. Uh, there was millions that lost their life because they would not bow the needle to Rome. And so you find that during that time, they had the ability to use the government to help enforce their religious mandates. Well, I'll tell you what, the uniting of church and state is not a good thing. Amen? It's not a good thing. I don't care whose church it is. It's not a good thing. And that's why this great country that we live in, praise God, was established on a separation of church and state. Amen? Amen. But I want you to notice once again, the Bible says after the little horn is going to be what? Judgment. Isn't that what we just read? Is going to be judgment. So sometime after 1798, the Bible says what's going to take place? Judgment is going to take place. I wanted us to understand that as we go into tonight. Now, the major theme of the book of Revelation is a conflict between Christ and Satan. Revelation describes details about the judgment. Daniel predicts when and where it will take place. God reveals in the judgment that he has done everything he can to save, and Satan has done everything that he can to what? To destroy. So where will this judgment take place? When will this judgment take place? Well, we're going to get into that here as we come into chapter 8. Chapter 8 of Daniel. Notice what it says in the very first verse. In the third year, the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, do you remember Daniel 7 when that took place? It took place in the first year. Do you remember what year that was? About the year 553 to 554. So now you're talking about the third year, so you're talking about two years later, so you're looking at about 551 to 552, that B.C., that this takes place. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. What's he meaning? It's the second time. Second time of what? Of a vision. Okay, what was the first one? Daniel 7. Yeah, Daniel 7. Remember, the others he'd interpreted. Okay? And even Nebuchadnezzar's, God gave to him, but he gave to him as a result of the prayer to, to be able to save all their lives. So the first vision he got all on his own, as far as, as uh, um, unsolicited, was this here in Daniel 7. So now we come to the second one here in Daniel 8. Notice we continue on. Verse 2, and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan. Now, Shushan was uh, the capital city uh, for the winter times. They used to, the kings used to go there during, in the kingdom of uh, Babylon and also even in the kingdom of Persia, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before me, before the river, a what? Come on, you got to help me here. A what? A ram which had how many horns? Two horns, and the two horns were high, but the higher one, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up what? Last. Hmm, that's interesting. 
And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became what? Great. So I want you to keep in the back of your mind for just a moment. The ram became what? Great. Notice we continue on. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat, some translations say a rough goat, came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler, that word means anger, against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Notice verse 8. Therefore, the he-goat waxed what? Very great. So the ram waxed what? Great. The he-goat now waxes very great. Notice we continue on. And when he was strong, we'll see if you can depict this. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and it and for it came up what? Four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So the one breaks off, four come up in its place. Notice. And out of one of them, verse 9, came forth a little horn which waxed what? Exceeding great. So first you have the ram and he waxed great. Then you have the he goat and he waxed very great. And now you have the little, this little horn and he waxes what? exceedingly great, that's right, exceeding great, toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's the prince? That's talking about Christ. That's right, Jesus. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it what? Prospered. Verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake. What's the next two words? How long? I'm in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under what? Underfoot. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the what? Sanctuary be... is higher and then you got this he goat with one horn and then that horn is broke up and and four other horns come out of it and then after that you see another little horn and it waxes itself great even beyond the two before it right because remember the ram was great the he goat was very great and the little horn is exceeding great that's absolutely right now as you begin to look at this, who is this ram? Who is the he goat? Who's this little horn? How can we know what it is? That's a good question, isn't it? Sure. Well, I want to give you a Bible answer. So let's continue to read. And I'm actually going to just read down through the majority of the rest of the chapter because the majority of the rest of it is interpretation. Notice with me here in verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. 
And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, what? Gabriel. I want you to put that in the back of your mind, because you're going to hear that again tomorrow night. The name Gabriel. Okay? And said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Hmm. How many of you believe we're living in the last days? I believe so. So does this apply to us? I would would believe it would. Verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the what? Come on, the time appointed the what? The end shall be. Notice verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of what? Okay, Media and Persia. So there's no doubt in our mind as to what, those, what the ram represented, right? Notice verse 21. And the rough goat, or the he-goat, is the king of Greece. That's right, Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Who is that? Alexander the Great. You're absolutely right. See, you're all tracking. Notice we continue on. Verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of this nation. But notice very clearly that last part of the verse. But not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to full, a king of fierce countenance And understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the what? Holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall, be, shall also stand up against what? The prince of princes, but he shall be what? Broken without hand. So when you begin to look at this, there's no doubt when we come to the ram, we know what the ram represents, doesn't it? Represents who? Media Persia, that's right. And then when we come to the rough goat or the he goat, that represents what? The kingdom of Greece. You, you, do you notice something? The Bible continues to give you succession of kingdoms. Amen? That's not by accident. The God of heaven knows what's going to take place. So here it is. You have from, from Media Persia now to Greece. And remember, the ram or Media Persia waxed great. Greece or the he goat waxed very great. But then you have a little horn that waxes what? Exceeding great. Who is this little horn? Okay, I think you're right. I believe that you see it start off with pagan Rome. Remember, your your kingdoms got larger as they went down through the kingdoms, right? And they got stronger. Now, they got less valuable, but they got stronger. They occupied more territory. And if, if Media Persia was great and Greece was very great, the only kingdom that could be next that would be exceeding great beyond this would be the kingdom of Rome. Amen? You with me? Okay. Now, the reason I stress that point is because there are some today that say this little horn is somebody different. Have you ever heard the name Antiochus Epiphanes? Okay. Most of you haven't. If you've got a question about it, write it out and put it in. We'll deal with it in question and answer time. Antioch Epiphanes. There's some out there today that believe that this little horn represents Antiochus Epiphanes. But here's the thing that I want to just quickly note to you. And that is, do you notice he was in a kingdom of Seleucus, which was one of the four generals. Remember it said that, that one, the, uh, the horn from the he-goat broke off and four came up in its place? Well, remember, 
That was symbolized by the same thing as in Daniel 7 by the four heads. And so here it is, you have the four generals. Well, they fought against one another, and it came down to two, Ptolemy and Seleucus. And he was in the kingdom of Seleucus. And he was one of those, one of 26 kings. But here's the thing that you need to understand about that. Number one, come with me to verse 22 again. It says, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand out of this nation, but not in his what? Power. So obviously, the kingdoms that came out of this, the Bible said, would never reach the power and the magnitude that Greece had when Alexander the Great was in charge. Amen? That's what it says. So how could you have one of those kings out of one of those four generals that now becomes greater than Alexander the Great? You can't. That's absolutely right. So, once again, I, I, you begin to look at the fact that, that this is talking about the next kingdom that would come on online, which I believe is pagan Rome or imperial Rome. Notice with me in verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the what? Pleasant land. Well, pleasant land almost always refers to Judea and in that area around Jerusalem. But, you know, Rome, when they, when they went after things, they started pressing south to Africa and to Egypt. They started going to the east where Greece was and down through Judea. In, in the way, place where Israel was. But notice verse 10. There's a changing of the guards here. Because in verse 9, this little horn is conquering land, isn't it? It goes to the east. It goes to the south. It goes to the, the pleasant land. So here it is. You begin to see it's conquering land. But notice there's a change that takes place in verse 10. And it waxed great even to the what? Host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and did what? Stamped upon them. So obviously you began to see now this power is beginning to persecute God's people. But notice it doesn't end there. Yea, verse 11, he magnified himself. Who's a he? It's the little horn. Yeah. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host? It's Jesus Christ. That's right. So now you have a power that is not only a political power, not only conquering lands, but it is transferred power to a point where it is magnifying himself against the God of heaven. Did we see a time when Rome did that? Now, Rome, imperial pagan Rome, persecuted God's people. But they, as a country, did not claim to be God. They did not attack God and try to elevate themselves up as Jesus Christ. So you have a transference of power. And remember, remember Wednesday night when we looked at the little horn, we saw that there would be a power that would rise, this little horn that would come out after the ten, that would seek to change times and laws. They'd persecute the saints, and they would speak blasphemies against God or against the Most High. Now let me ask you a question. What is blasphemy? The Bible says that Jesus was, was accused of blasphemy twice. Once because he claimed to be God, and once because he claimed to be able to forgive sins. Now, was Jesus God? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Then if he was God, was he able to forgive sins? Absolutely, no doubt about it. But any other man that claims to be God or claims to be able to forgive your sins is committing what? Blasphemy. So now it is you began to see this power rise again here. It's showing, it, showing up again where it magnifies himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, verse 11, by him the daily what? Sacrifice was taken away. Now, if you look at that word sacrifice, 
What do you notice? It's italicized. What does that mean? It means it was added. It wasn't in the original manuscripts. So when you began to look at this, it was the word sacrifice was supplied by the translators. And I think they were trying to help you to understand something. But that word daily comes from the Hebrew word tamid, which simply means continual. Now let me ask you a question. If he magnified himself to the prince of the host or to, against Jesus Christ, what is it that Jesus is doing continually? Okay, he's praying, ministering, interceding. I think all of those are correct. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says, He ever liveth to make intercession for you, right? Praise God. So when Jesus left this earth, he went back and went into the holy place to begin to, of heaven to begin to minister as our high priest. Praise God we don't have to slay a lamb and confess to a priest. Amen? Praise God we don't have to go to a, to a, a pastor or a priest on this earth. Jesus says, I have ascended into the heavens. And he says, if you confess your sins, I will forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Praise God. I can go straight to heaven and talk to him. That's what we call prayer. Amen? Praise God. But let me ask you, is there a power on this earth that does claim to be God and does claim to be able to forgive sins? Yeah. Here's what you see as, as papal Rome has now come to light. You've seen that transference from pagan Rome to papal Rome. And now you see them rise to a point where they're attacking God himself and it says, and by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. And you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Sacrifice. But remember, that word was supplied. And what it really means is they took the continual away. How would you take the continual high priest ministry of Christ away? You bring it to the earth. You usurp the power. You're absolutely right. You bring down the power to this earth, bring it to man, and as a result of that, you have stopped the continual ministry of Christ because people aren't going to Him. Amen? Notice we continue on. It's not done. And by Him the daily sacrifice was taken away in the place of His sanctuary was what? Cast down. Now we learned the other night in Hebrews chapter 8 that the Lord, Jesus Christ, is a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary amen so now it is we began to see that this power takes and brings the sanctuary down how'd they do that once again bringing you back to earthly ministry as opposed to a heavenly ministry bringing you to an earthly priesthood as opposed to a heavenly priesthood I'll tell you what, for me tonight, I've got one high priest. His name is Jesus Christ, and he lives in heaven. Amen? Praise God. And I can go to him anytime I want, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And the Bible says, call upon me, and I will answer thee. Amen? Amen. Notice, it says, in the place of this sanctuary was cast down. Notice verse 12. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of what? Transgression. What's transgression? Okay, sin. In other words, they, they did wrong, didn't they? They sinned against God. Notice. By reason of transgression. And it cast down the what? Truth to the ground. And it practiced. And what? And it prospered. Now you begin to look at this whole scenario and you begin to ask yourself the question. What were they thinking? Well, I'll tell you what you're thinking. When you turn your back on God and begin to look at your own feelings and what you want, and when you begin to think, well, it doesn't really matter, that's what you think and what you interpret and what you want to do. I just got a letter in the mail today from someone that had been taking some Bible studies. And they said, when it came up, the subject came up about keeping God's law or, or worshiping on Sabbath. And they said, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's all tradition. What, what do you think 
when God says very clearly, I want you to do this, and we choose to do something else. When you turn your back away from truth, what does the Bible say? If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Amen? That's 1 John 1, 6. Verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, now what does it mean to walk in the light? To walk in the truth. So you don't worry about what you don't know. Every series of meetings, I have people come and they're curious. They want to hear what is he going to preach. And they like it until it hits something that they hadn't heard before. And then it's like, well, that's, that's his thing. But let me ask you a question. What have we studied night by night? Come on. We've studied the Bible. Have we let the Bible interpret itself? Yes. With the exception of we've looked at history. Because remember... Prophecy is simply history written ahead of time. So as we look at it and as it unfolds, we can look back and say, ah, that's what fits. That's what works. That's what God was talking about. So when you begin to look here, it says that they cast the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. Why would we want to follow error? Why would we want to just continue in the path just because it's the way we like? Is that a good question? Jesus, as a matter of fact, says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? I think that's a really, really good question. And yet, millions tonight are simply going about their business, not worried about it. And listen, I'm not trying to cast guilt on you. I'm simply trying to say, I want the truth. Because the Bible says this power rose up and has deceived a lot of people, and people are walking in error because it says that it cast down the truth to the ground, and it prospered, right? That means it, it, it did well. After all, stop and think. The largest religion in the world is what? Catholic Church. Have they practiced? Yep. Have they prospered? Yeah. yeah. In fact, one person said one time, they said, if the church decided to, they could probably pay off our debt, the national debt. The issue is this, and that is that I'm not trying to pick on a church. Remember this very clearly. God loves Catholic people. When Jesus died, Jesus died on the cross for God so loved the world. And that includes Protestants. It includes Catholics. It includes uh, Islam. It includes everybody. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for every man, woman, and child that would ever live. Amen? Praise God. Let's be clear on that. We are saved by grace. That's the only way we can be saved, through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we need to understand something. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Why? Because they're a transcript of the character of God. They help us to know how to be like him. Amen? Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.5. What does Jesus want from us? He wants our heart. And he wants us to love him enough that we're willing to serve him. Amen? That's why, you remember what we read there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that, that we must receive the things that we have done in our body. That's how you live. Amen? That's how you live. So we're going to have to give an answer for what we do, what we say, where we go. And trust me, you know, you've heard, actions speak louder than words. So merely to say, Jesus, I love you, and then walk yourself away from the light he is showing you isn't a good thing, is it? No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Now, he began to look, and I want to bring you to the screen for a moment, because it was six attacks that this little horn did. Number one, the little horn trampled on them, or on the stars, people. 
persecuted. Number two, the little horn magnified himself to Christ. Number three, the little horn subverted the continual ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The place of his sanctuary was cast down by the little horn. Did the papacy do that? Yeah. Bringing you to an earthly priesthood as opposed to a heavenly priesthood, and now the continual intercession of Christ has been, has been nullified or done away with because people don't know that's where they can go. Amen? Being brought to an earthly sanctuary as opposed to a heavenly. Little Horn's activities are characterized as what? Transgression. Now, do you want to be a part of transgression or do you want to be a part of light? I want to be a part of light. Verse 6, or not yeah, verse 6, number 6. The Little Horn threw truth to the ground. Now, I want to stop for just a moment and ask you a question. Wouldn't it make sense... The papacy ruled for 1,260 years in the Dark Ages, right? We talked about this Wednesday night. If you take 100 years as a generation, okay, just for easy math. Now, we know in the Dark Ages it was down under 20, but it's okay. Let's for easy math, let's do 100. They ruled for 1,260 years. How many generations would that be? Okay, probably 13, but let's just take 12. Let's just do easy, okay? That, that means you, that means daddy, that means granddaddy, that means great-granddaddy, that means great-great-granddaddy, that means great-great-great-granddaddy, that means great-great-great-great-granddaddy, that means great-great-great-great-great-granddaddy, that means great-great-great-great-great-great-granddaddy. You with me? The reason I'm trying to say this is this, I want you to catch a point. When you are taught something from a little kid on up, you begin to always think it's right. Mom and dad wouldn't be wrong. It's the way you're raised. You defend it to the death. But is it possible, is it possible that what you were taught from a little kid on up isn't right? Is it possible? Sure, it's possible. So the issue you have to now say is, okay, I don't need to just simply follow a church. I don't need to simply follow a preacher. I need to uplift the Word of God, amen, and Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus will tell us everything we need to know, amen? And so we look at this and we find the fact that it, 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 it threw down the truth and it practiced and it prospered. It's the same reason when we looked the other night at, at, at why last Tuesday night about the whole idea of keeping the Sabbath. And the Sabbath really isn't on Sunday. It's on Saturday. The Bible's clear on that. And so here it is. You began to see, well, why? And then Saturday, Wednesday night we looked and saw that there was a power that rose, and that's the little horn power, the papacy, that rose and thought to change times and laws. They thought they could get away with bringing people to them as opposed to promoting Jesus. And I'll tell you what, and all the world wandered after the beast. People have followed in a succession. Stop and think about it. When Martin Luther came out of, of uh, uh, the Catholic Church, it wasn't because he wanted to. He, when he nailed the 95 theses on the board, door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany, on October 31, 1517, his intent was not to, to fight the Catholic Church. His intent was to bring them back to sola scriptura. Reform. He wanted them to come back into line with Scripture. Sola Scriptura. But see, they had other plans. In fact, as we mentioned the other night, if you study about Martin Luther, the church put up a, a team to fight and, and argue with, with the theology of Martin Luther. And this little group came to the leaders of the church and said, listen, you're going to have to change your strategy because we can't fight him using the Bible alone. The only way that you can fight Martin Luther's arguments is to raise the church on a level with or above the Scriptures. 
It's a shame, but that's exactly what they did. And so that way, they're able to take and now say, well, the church says we can do this and this and this and this and this, regardless of what God's word said. In fact, I wrote you a quote the other night that says the Pope is of so great authority that he can even modify divine law. Now, I'll tell you what, you may believe that, and if you do, you're entitled to your opinion. I don't believe that. I believe there's only one Godhead, and it's in heaven. I believe Jesus Christ established it, and he established it for a reason, and he is holy, his law is holy, and he's asking us to be holy. Amen? Amen. So you began to look at this whole idea of the, of the casting down of the sanctuary and the truth to the ground. And you can see, after all these generations, why it was that the majority of the world today worships on Sunday. Majority of Christendom is in the Catholic Church. And once again, listen, this is not a message against Catholic. This is a message about a power that chose to walk away from God. Wouldn't you want to know? I would want to know. And then make the choice myself. If I'm happy where I'm at and I want to do my own thing, then that's okay. Do your own thing. I can't stop you. And you know what? Jesus won't stop you. But yet there, remember it says in in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man will open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. But there's some things you need to understand about that. The Bible says he's knocking at the door. But he never opens it. You have to open it. He's calling you by name. He's knocking at the door. And you have a choice. Do I open the door? Do I allow him to come in? Do I walk in the light that he's giving me? Or do I choose to continue in the way I've been? Amen? Amen. Now, let's come back. Verse 13. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint that spake, what's the next two words? How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the what? sanctuary be cleansed now i'll tell you what if you've got a strong's concordance and tonight somebody's going to walk home with one but i want you to know if you've got a strong's concordance at home when you get home look this word cleansed up and you'll find that it really talks about making it right or justifying i like the word justifying because me when i think of cleanse you know, I, I, I think of washing down the walls and sweeping the floors and mopping them and, and, you know, getting rid of all the dirt. And when it's true, Jesus wants to get rid of the dirt of our heart. I kind of feel like I'm being swept out. Where when I look at the word meaning justified, Jesus died on the cross to justify saving you. Now, he can't justify saving you when you want to on purpose and willingly live in sin. Amen? Amen. So notice it says, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now let me ask you a question. What is this transgression of desolation? Jesus talked about it. Go with me to Matthew. Keep something here. We're coming back. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And do you remember when Jesus and the disciples were walking out of the temple and out of Jerusalem and they said, wow, look at this. Look at this building. And Jesus says, I tell you, there shall not be one stone left upon another. Well, you can imagine. In fact, let me just take you there. Matthew 24 And I want to start with verse 1. Matthew chapter 24 in verse 1. If you're there, please say amen. 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 And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, 
See you all, see you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one what? Stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the what? End of the world. I want you to catch this. Jesus is looking down into the future, right? He sees the time when the temple will be destroyed and overthrown. When did that take place? In 70 A.D. That's right, when Rome marched upon Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting, Jesus is pointing down there, but see, they looked at it, the disciples were thinking, wow, if the temple's going to be destroyed, that has to be the end of the world. So therefore, they asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy, come on, what's it say? Of thy coming and of the end of the world. So Jesus gives them some dual-fold signs. Number one, that they can know about when the destruction of Jerusalem is going to take place, but also when they will know when the second coming of Jesus is near. Because he was going about one thing, they were asking a completely different question because they assumed they were the same event. Okay, So he gives them some dual-fold signs. Notice the number one concern that Jesus had. The number one concern with his disciples that had walked with him for three and a half years. If anybody knew God, if anybody knew Christ, if anybody knew his will, it should have been those 12, don't you think? And yet notice here in verse 4, Jesus says unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you remember what we just learned about this power that would rise and it would cast truth to the ground and it would practice and it would prosper and jesus tells his disciples listen take heed that no man de deceive you now if that was his number one concern for his disciples that had walked with him for three and a half years physically what do you think his number one concern would be for you and me i think it'd be the same What's that? It's just scary. Yeah. Well, you know what, what's scary about it is that many times we choose to walk in darkness. We reject the light because it's not what we were taught. It's not what we were raised with. It's not what we thought. It's not even what we like. But I want you to understand something. Serving Jesus isn't about what you like. Serving Jesus is about surrendering your heart to someone that loved you enough that before you were ever born, he came down and he died for you. When I first, you know, I was running my own course, and when I first realized that Jesus died on the cross for me, for me, And I realized that if I chose to go to hell, and, and listen, there's going to be millions of people that go to hell, including a lot that that claim to be Christians. And I can give you the text to prove it. But here's the thing. If I chose to go to hell, you see, it's a choice we make because Jesus paid the price. Amen? He paid the price. All you got to do is, is surrender to Him and let Him be Lord of your life. Serve Him. Walk in, your, walk in His light. And you can have assurance of salvation. Praise God for that. Amen? But you see, when you choose to walk your own way, and do your own thing, then you choose the ending results. You choose to stand before Jesus without the blood of Christ. And we know, the Bible says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's the thing. If I go to hell, it's because I have chosen to go to hell. And I began to realize that if I went to hell, I've let Jesus die for me in vain. Wouldn't that be true? I said, for me. If I chose to go to hell, I would have allowed Jesus to die for me because he died for me too, didn't he? I'd let him do that in vain. And I'll tell you what, when I really looked at it, I couldn't, I couldn't let him do that. I couldn't let him do that. I had to be willing to say, Lord, let me be a part of your family. Let me walk in the light of truth. Oh, not just what the church teaches, not just, and you'll find, you'll find the more you get to know me, I'm not about teaching church doctrine, I'm about 
teaching the Bible. I want to lift up Jesus. I pray every night when I come, before I come out, that Jesus will be uplifted and that we'll see Jesus sitting high on his throne. Praise God. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Praise God. Amen? Amen. But remember this. In lifting Jesus up is also to lift up the light of his word and help us to understand so that we are not deceived. Amen? Amen. Now Jesus goes on. He talks about wars and rumors of wars and and nations against nations and famines and pestilence and iniquity and all of that stuff. Jump down with me to verse 15. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet. Now, have we just read about the abomination of desolation? Okay, it words it in Daniel as a transgression of, of desolation. But notice, here's the key to that whole, the whole subject. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. What's the next few words? Stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. So you begin to look and it says, Jesus says, when you see this power that is not my power, stand in the holy place. Now, where on this earth was there a holy place? In Jerusalem. Remember the tabernacle? In fact, that's, that's what got destroyed in 70 A.D. You see, in the most holy place is where Jesus himself, where God met with his people. The Shekinah glory dwelt over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. So that was considered the holy place. And when you have secularism that takes over the spot of the holy place, you now have a transgression that makes desolate. Did that happen? Sure. 70 A.D., the Romans marched on Jerusalem, attacked them, destroyed the city, destroyed the sanctuary. It burnt. Rome, secular. Rome, against God, now stands in the holy place. But remember, this is twofold. So not only did it take place in 70 A.D., it also has a second meaning. Was there another time, as we look back in history, that we can see that there was a non, I can't say spiritual, I can say this, that we saw a religious power that taught error rather than truth that took over the holy place. Except for this time, It wasn't the earthly holy place. It was the heavenly holy place. Remember what we just read in Daniel chapter 8? Go back with me. Daniel chapter 8. I believe it's verse 11. Daniel chapter 8. Let me just start in verse 11. Daniel chapter 8, verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. It cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. You see, you now have the abomination of desolation where you take away the holiness or high priest ministry of Christ, and you bring it to earth. Now, that's not talking about preachers that hold up Jesus. That's talking about a system of worship called the papacy that now thinks to take the place of, of Jesus Christ they do not point you to a heavenly priesthood they point you to a what earthly priesthood they do not ask you to go to Jesus to forgive your sins they do what they ask you to come to the priest 
to get forgiveness of sins. You see, the truth was cast down. The sanctuary was cast down. And Jesus says, when you see them occupy the holy place, that's the abomination that makes desolate. What they're doing is they're teaching people that you can come to earth to get your answers when in reality, my dear friends, we got to go to Jesus. Amen? Praise God, we can go to Jesus. And praise God, He is able to forgive my sins. Now listen, I don't mean any disrespect. But I could say Hail Marys till I was blue in the face and that wouldn't forgive me. Jesus says, if you confess your sins, and it's talking about to him, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. That's lifting the truth back up. Now, take your Bibles and go with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Keep your finger right here in Daniel chapter 8. Just before the book of James. Hebrews chapter 8, it's right after the T's, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, then you have Philemon, then the Hebrews. And I'd like chapter 8 in verse 1. We referred to it a minute ago, I want you to see it. Notice chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, now of the things as we have spoken, this is the sum. What does that mean? A summary, okay. This, this is a conclusion. This wraps it up, okay, in a, in a nutshell. Okay, here's the sum. Here's the totality of it all. We have such a what? High priest. Now, who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus, that's right. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of Come on, majesty in the heavens. So we have a high priest where? In heaven, not on this earth. We have a high priest in heaven. Notice verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Praise God for that. Jesus has gone back to heaven to intercede for you and me. Amen? But you remember, remember, Come back with me. Come back with me to, to Daniel 8. Remember we saw in Daniel chapter 3, three times it was mentioned that there would be the little horn or the papacy followed by judgment. Three times we saw that, which to me says to me, don't, don't forget this, doesn't it? If God repeats it three times, I'm thinking he's wanting to get my attention. So we can know that sometime after 1798 that the judgment is going to take place. And now notice what it talks about in verse 13. And I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and transgression of desolation to give both a sanctuary and a host to be trodden underfoot? It's almost like if you were going to ask today, how long are you going to allow all this to go on? And what's his answer in verse 14? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Wow. Here Daniel gets the message that this is going to be allotted to go on for a while. But there is a time that it will come to a conclusion. And the Bible says unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's interesting as you begin to look at this whole idea. Because Daniel wasn't sure what that was all talking about. Jump down with me to the end, last two verses. We read through to verse 25. Let's look at verse 26 and 27. It says, the vision of the evening and mornings which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Verse 27, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, and everybody understood it. The Bible says, 
How many understood it? Nobody understood it. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What didn't they understand? Did he not understand who the ram was? Oh, he understood that, didn't he? That wasn't the question. Was the question who the he goat was? No, the Bible tells us who that was. Was it really a question of the little horn? No. What was the question? The question was, how long? And what was the answer? 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When you begin to look at this whole idea, Daniel didn't understand it, and we know that it says it's for what time? Daniel's time? It's for what time? The end times. Which means you and I ought to know about it, don't you think? It's telling us that it deals with the end of time. Daniel doesn't understand because it has to do, and after all, stop and think about it, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel was taken captive. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. It had been desolate for some almost 70 years. And now all of a sudden he gets a vision. After 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, we'll learn tomorrow night, but the cleansing of the sanctuary has to do with the equal of the Day of Atonement. That's when every year the sanctuary on earth was cleansed. But we'll look at that tomorrow night. The the interesting thing that you see here is Daniel now has a question. How long? What's the answer? Under 2,300 days, 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So he's confused about the idea. How is it that the sanctuary is going to be cleansed when it's laid in ruins? So he didn't understand. Now let me bring you to the screen. What about, what's the meaning of the 2,300 days? Now, we looked on Wednesday night about the meaning of a prophetic day, didn't we? You see, this vision deals with the end of time. It deals with the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? It deals with a symbolic period. Remember Ezekiel 4, 6? I have laid on you a day for a year. You can also write down Numbers 14, 34. So in prophecy, it's well accepted that, that a, a pro- prophetic day is equal to a literal year. Okay, That's important to know. You'll see more tomorrow night on that. But the reality is, is that here it is, when we're talking about 2,300 days, we're obviously in prophecy. What are we talking about? We're really talking about 2,300 years, right? Now obviously the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel uses a lot of symbols, don't they? Here, Daniel 7, we saw the beast. What do they represent? Kingdoms. So they're symbolic, aren't they? And then we see in, Dan- in Revelation 19, Jesus coming on a white horse. Well, is that trying to depict that Jesus and all the angels of heaven when he comes are going to be riding white horses? No. That's, it's symbolic. So here, when we look at the 2300 days, we're actually talking about 2300 days years because a prophetic day is equal to a literal year amen so we're talking about a 2300 year span of time all focused around jesus and all focused about what his plan is for us remember three times in the book of daniel 7 we saw the sequence of the little horn followed by judgment and this leads us here down through history to the time past the papal roman power sat past 1798 to the time period in which you will see the judgment or this cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary now the burning question i would have next is when is that going to take place Would you like to know? Come tomorrow night. I've divided this up because they're in two chapters, but you're going to see something amazing as chapter one and or chapter eight and nine go together. But you're going to see the fact that here it is. And in fact, that's why I've called it the most amazing Bible prophecy, part one. And tomorrow night is part two. You will not want to miss it because tomorrow night. 
God is going to fill in the blanks of that 2300 years. So you will not want to miss that. But for tonight, let me simply ask you the question. How many of you want to accept Jesus Christ as your high priest in the heavenly sanctuary tonight? If that's your desire, I want to invite you to stand with me right now. Lord, dear kind Heavenly Father, what a privilege we have to be able to call upon You and know that You will answer us. To be able to know that You are alive and well. And Lord, as we've just begun to open this prophecy of the 2300 years, Lord, we want answers. We want to know what does the Bible teach. And we need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. So tonight, Lord, we're standing on our feet because we want you to know we want to accept you as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And so, Lord, for tonight, we pray that you'll take us home safely, that you give us a good night's rest. And, Lord, I pray that you'll bring us out safely again tomorrow evening. Is my prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.